everyone, my name is Trudy Worm, and tonight I'm going to take this opportunity to speak with you about a problem. So please look to your left and look at the person to your right. This problem is so severe in America that it will affect one of the three of you in your lifetimes. In fact, around 50 million Americans are affected by this problem. And yet, only 6,800 cases or complaints were filed with a federal agency that was created to explicitly deal with this problem. And of these 6,800 cases, over half were thrown out. Some settled, others just gave up. And here we have this little black box. In 2015, only 20 cases went to court of this problem that affects millions of Americans. That's your chance of winning this problem, winning a case of this problem in the American justice system. But when we take into account all of the problems that never go reported to this federal agency, your chances really look like this making it more likely that an asteroid will fall on your head while you're walking down the block in Brooklyn <laughs> than you are to win your sexual harassment case in the American court system. An asteroid. <laughs> Keep that in mind today <laughs> while I talk to you about Title VII litigation. Title VII begins with the 1964 Civil Rights Act. This monumental piece of legislation signed into law by President Lyndon B. Johnson and advocated for by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. prohibited the discrimination of Americans on the basis of sex, religion, color, and national origin. And if you look at the language here of Title VII, you should notice you know, once you ignore the use of male pronouns and the insinuation of patriarchal power, <laughs> you'll notice that the term sexual harassment is omitted. Nevertheless, the government decided the best way to protect Americans through Title VII was through the creation of a government agency. And that's the Equal Opportunity, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, or the EEOC. That's the federal agency I was talking to you about earlier. And today, they define sexual harassment like this. So how do we go from the complete explicit lack of the term sexual harassment to explicitly describing, defining, and prohibiting it? That's primarily through the work of a feminist legal theorist named Katherine McKinnon. In 1977, Katherine McKinnon wrote a book called Sexual Harassment of Working Women. And in this book, she argued that sexual harassment is sexual discrimination because the act reinforces the social inequality of women. And because it does that, women are protected through Title VII, as the Civil Rights Act of 1964 stipulates. Her book, was so pervasive that in 1980, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission took her theories as a guidelines in prohibiting sexual discrimination and harassment. So Katherine McKinnon defines sexual harassment or really identifies two different types of sexual harassment. The first is quid pro quo, and the second is a hostile work environment. Quid pro quo, which is really just Latin for this for that, means when an authority figure offers something or offers to take something away from another in exchange for a demand, which is typically sexual. The second type of sexual harassment, a hostile work environment, is best described through a court case. This court case changed and altered court precedent and the, and the trajectory of Title VII litigation. In Meritor Savings Bank v. Vinson, the hostile work environment paradigm was created, and Catherine McKinnon herself was co-counsel for Michelle Vinson. After Michelle Vinson was fired from her job at Meritor Savings Bank, 
She sued the vice president of the bank for sexual harassment. She alleged that he had coerced her into having sexual relations with him. He had made several sexual advances while at work. And finally, he raped her many times. Now, before the court, Catherine McKinnon argued that this harassment was so pervasive and it was so severe that it completely altered the work environment in which Michelle Vincent existed in. And it altered the environment to make it completely abusive. Before this case, the only types of sexual harassment cases that were litigated and won were the quid pro quo type. So here we see Title VII litigation being expanded upon. Our second feminist theorist, Vicki Schultz, thinks that we should also keep on expanding Title VII litigation. But she wants to de-emphasize the type of sexual harassment in all and take into account all of the other types of harassment that exist in the American workplace. She argues that harass sexual harassment is never just based on sex. In fact, it's part of a broader pattern of discrimination that is actually just based on difference. Harris v. Forklift Systems is a case that will show you why we need to expand Title VII and why all types of harassment need to be identified, litigated, and we must be protected from it. Teresa Harris was a manager at an equipment rental company called Forklift Systems Incorporated. And after she quit her job, she sued the president of the company for sexual harassment. She charged that he made several sexual advances, as well as made fun of her in a sexually demeaning manner in front of other employees. And Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, writing for the court opinion, noted that this harassment was not severe or pervasive enough to fall under the hostile work environment paradigm. But she also noted that this harassment that Teresa Harris experienced wasn't just merely offensive. And so Sandra Day O'Connor created a middle path for sexual harassment here. But as Vicki Schultz aptly points out, the Supreme Court missed a very clear opportunity to expand Title VII litigation and do what it set out to do, which is prohibit discrimination in the workplace. Teresa Harris wasn't only sexually harassed. She was denied a company car, she was denied an office, and she was denied annual raises despite being the manager because she was different. She was a woman. And so here we see that Title VII litigation needs to be expanded upon so it can protect all of us, no matter our sex, race, class, or religion. Our third feminist theorist today, Drusilla Cornell, argues that Title VII does need to be expanded. But she does so in a radically different way than Vicki Schultz. In her book, The Imaginary Domain, Drusilla Cornell argues that because of our overly sexualized and naturalized work environments that we exist in, those of us that are different, are systemically denied our possibility and capability of living our best lives. Her solution lies in redefining and refocusing sexual harassment litigation and Title VII litigation. But she does so in a very interesting way here. She focuses and roots her theory in self-respect. Why self-respect? Well, political philosopher John Rawls argues what could happen when we don't have it. We feel our plans are of little value. We cannot pursue them with pleasure. Without it, nothing may seem worth doing. We fall into cynicism and apathy. So Drusilla Cornell wants to take this theory and use it to protect all Americans, which is the what, as we said, Title VII was originally about. On Kale v. Sundowner Offshore Services, we'll show you why this is needed. Joseph and Kale worked on an oil rig in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. And like Michelle Vinson and like Teresa Harris, he was different. But he wasn't a woman. 
he was gay. And because he was gay, his coworkers sexually harassed him by subjecting him to making fun of him because he was gay, but going as far as to rape him, sodomizing him with a bar of soap. If nothing I've said to you so far today has shocked you, what I'm about to say next will. Famously conservative Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia advocated for homosexuals here. <laughs> yeah. He said that while same-sex sex discrimination assuredly wasn't the principal evil that Congress was concerned with when enacting Title VII and the Civil Rights Act, it was still harassment. And all Americans deserve to be protected from harassment, which it sounds very reasonable, right? But Justice Scalia, being Justice Antonin Scalia, issued a caveat. Once we expand equality, once we protect more Americans in, in America, through the civil justice system, and finally, once we maybe include the queer community, he issued this caveat which was he was really worried that Title VII would become a general civility code for the American workplace. I'd like to challenge Scalia. Why not? Why can't Title VII become a general civility code with, for the American workplace? With things such as sexual orientation and gender identity coming to the forefront of the American justice system, including Title VII, we need to consider how our laws protect all of our people, especially those that are different. Remember that tiny, minuscule, infinitesimal chance you have of winning your sexual harassment lawsuit? In what way are we protected? Do we have the possibility of having self-respect? What economic advantages are we really allowed? And finally, in the American justice system, can we have respect at all? Something is very clearly wrong, and we must not accept this legal norm. It's up to us to consider how to change it, and the time is now to change it as well. Thank you.